Caboose, you gotta chill. I'm making a video. Meet my breaker bar. This is Lucy. I got her from an auto parts store in 1992 back when I was in college. I'm old. But uh, anyway, I'm going to start tearing the uh, main bolts out of here. And there is actually a loosening sequence, just like there's a tightening sequence. And the methodology behind it is real simple. You start at the top right bolt. Each time you go to a new bolt, you want to go to the one that's the farthest away from the one you're working on. So you'd start here. You'd go here. Then you go here. Then you go here. Then here. Then here. 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 It's that simple. Anyway, this technique is used both on the cylinder head and the mains. I don't think it matters which way you start on this. The point behind doing this this way is just to try to relieve as little pressure as gradually as possible from the crankshaft. So you start at the top right, and you go all the way across the block. Then you go as far as possible, so from here to here, and you go as far as possible as far as possible and there you have it good job Lucy I'm gonna go ahead and take them out time for the mains to go just remember number two's got that one on the uh, intake side of the block now you want to keep two bolts with you because if you're taking this apart there's a nice little technique here So anyway, if you don't have any luck with that, and you happen to have a pry bar handy, you want to be careful up against the edge of the block. The reason why you want to be careful is because you don't want to mess up the mating surface where the oil pan goes. Take a pry bar right to the edge of the center main cap. Oop, there, goes. there we go. A smaller pry bar would probably work better than that one. But there you go, she's loose. And that main bearing right there. I think it's just wore out. It's all the way through the outer coating here. So it looks like it might have been a little bit of oil starved. The coating's gone almost all the way around. These you pop off with a hammer. The 1G cars, this is called a suitcase handle. Just give it a whack on the suitcase handle, it'll loosen right up. And it looks like we have the same problem here with these main bearings. This one right here looks like it's worn just on an edge, so I might have a taper problem. It might be out of round. Right there, you see that? This one's worn evenly across, though. It looks like there's some scratching in the bottom of it. And remember, these are also marked for which ones they go back in. That's the R for rear. And they're evenly worn across the faces, so I've got one of them that might be experiencing some taper. And what you want to do is make notes about these and which one of the mains they go on. So, judging by the bearing wear, I have a little bit of inspection to do to the crankshaft. Let's see what's up. Now, on cars that have studs in them, if you have studs that are protruding because you studded your block for the mains, what you want to do is take pieces of a coolant hose and stick them over all the bolts so that you don't scratch your crank coming out. But because this had factory bolts in it, we don't have that hazard. And you just lift straight up. And it's not light. You want to always set your crankshaft down very gently. It's not a good idea to just wheel them over and ding, stand them up on their ends. Because they're heavy and you can bend the crankshaft by putting excessive force on it like that. First thing I want to do is wipe the journals clean. Let me see what comes off of it here. All right, meow. You see this thing? Remember this? Yeah, had our info about the rod journals and stuff on it. Well, it's good, nice knowing you. It already has half of our work done on it. Half the info about the crank is already uh, written there about the rod stuff. So we're going to keep this handy. The first thing you want to note is that previously when I had this stuff written up here on the board, number four was up here at the top left and number one was on this side. And number one is at the front of the block and so is the snout. We want to go this way with it. And uh, simply up here, just write number five, number four, two, number one. These are all rods. All right, on the crankshaft, these will represent the main bearings. You want one measurement going off of 90 and one on the center line. 
there's two defining characteristics to this crankshaft. Right here we have a woodruff key that's pressed in and that uh, helps to hold the, uh, the crank pulley straight. It's splined on here with the timing gear and so that needs to stay put and this piece is machined deeply into that end of the shaft. And then the other distinguishing factor is there's a stud right there in the crankshaft. This is what aligns the flywheel to keep everything in balance. So we have the dowel pin and we have the woodruff key. What I do when I'm taking these measurements is I have a D and then we need to take two measurements. So there's a D1, there's D2, really that's a D. And then we have the Woodruff key, Woodruff 1 and Woodruff 2. And the reason why I'm doing the D's and the W's is because these are 90 degrees out of phase with each other. It just simply represents which way I'm going to put the micrometers on the crankshaft. You take two measurements on each one of the journals on the outside edges. The reason why you want to do that is because you have oil holes here and you're not going to get an accurate measure if you stick the plunger in the middle of one of those things. It helps us measure taper by getting both sides of the bearing. We can check for a variance in the measurement and tell if we're off one side or another, like we saw on the uh, like we saw on the front bearing set number one, right now. That's uneven wear, so I'll be scrutinizing that part of the crankshaft. So here we go back to the micrometers again, and uh, I've got a measurement here that's going to be between two and three inches. So we get our two to three inch micrometer and the reference. All right, the first thing we want to do is zero the micrometer. And in order to do that, we just get our little two inch reference here and uh, place it on the anvil. And then we turn this down. And it looks like it's about a half a thousandth off. It's reading a little bit on the fatter side of the zero. So it's close to a half a thousandth. And uh, what we're gonna do here now is measure the crankshaft. Alright, now we're reading about a half a thousandth fat. Looks like I've got uh, 2.243. And I'm going to guess that looks like about a 2 or a 3 after that. It's almost in the exact same spot above the line too. That's a great thing. And the reason I'm scrutinizing that and making guesses at this point is because I want to try to see if there's any effective taper. So even though the tool isn't as accurate as that, I'm trying to judge once I take the half thousandth off about how much is left on the, on the micrometer. It's like 2.2432, 2 2.2432, 2.2431, no, that's a 2, 2.2432. The first measurement I'm doing, since I'm doing left to right, is on the rear side of the crank. So I'm measuring that bore as D1, and I'm measuring the next bore up as D2. So when I go to the fourth one, the one on the back is D1, and the one on the front is D2. Same thing on the Ws. This gets valuable information about three things. The diameter of the bearing journals, crankshaft journal taper, and run out. So you just use a micrometer and measure multiple axes. Then you take those measurements and look for egg shaping and taper. If the crank is out of round, it causes both wear and vibration in your rotating assembly. So it's at this point where you want to look for variations in your measurements. What you want to see is no more than two ten thousandths of an inch variance between your one and twos for both your D and W measurements, and less than six ten thousandths of an inch variance in your number one D and one Ws and your number two D and two Ws. I can't find a specification for this journal anywhere, neither in print nor on the web but this is how you measure your thrust bearing journal. Use your calipers and find the narrowest measurement you can. It's unlikely that you'll find this having any run out on it, so you don't need to measure multiple axes. But you can do something useful with this number. If you measure the width of your thrust bearing, take the smallest one you can measure and subtract it from the crank journal measurement. The reason these are useful numbers is because once you get your new set of bearings, you can measure the new thrust bearing width, subtract it from your crank thrust journal measurement, and know what your thrust clearance will be prior to assembly, although you should always double check it. So here's a super mega close up of the radius, radii. Uh, what you've got here, this little section right here, that, as you can see it moving on the tool. It's got a little black line around it from the oil baking on to the outside. But you can see that little bit right there. 
and I'm not I'm not touching this hard I'm just lightly trying to demonstrate the curve it's about a three millimeter radius maybe four but this is a piece you want to look at make sure it doesn't have any scoring or anything on it you can see I'm just uh, I'm not leaving any permanent marks on that there but you want to feel that to see if there's any grooves or anything cut in it if you have that problem then uh, your rods are too big or your bearing clearance is a little tight you just don't want to feel any deep scored marks that's the important thing another popular test is the penny test you take a penny what you do with this is uh you put the edge on here and you rub over any of the parts on the crankshaft to feel a little bit rough the reason you want to use a penny is because it's softer than the steel crankshaft you don't want to do a lot of grinding on a DSM crankshaft because it has a very well hardened outer layer if you wind up cutting into that and machining it off it's hard to get that back to the same hardness so anyway a better rule of thumb other than the penny test is to use your thumb and if you can feel anything on it with your fingernail then that's bad news and you would need to polish that journal um, seems to be okay no grooves or anything I'm happy about that so if you find any substantial grooves in your crankshaft it's not a total deal breaker there's only one place where those should really be and that's where the seals ride if you find one it means there's a piece of trash that got trapped in a in a journal and it's okay as long as it goes in a parallel line all the way around the crank there's nothing that you know breaks off center from it and would scrape a bearing down but uh, you know for the most part if you polish that out that's fine high spots are worse for your bearings than low spots and uh, the reason why is pretty clear it would cut a pretty deep groove in the bearing surface all the way around and compromise its strength in holding up the crankshaft if you do have a high spot chances are likely that something got embedded in the surface of the crankshaft usually that can be polished out but in some cases if it's embedded too deep there's nothing you can do about it that one would be junk I'd like to take a minute to look at the size of the rods now this is the surface right here that goes up against the crank counterweights this is the piece that makes contact just above the fillet radius you can see there's kind of a lighter spot all the way around on the edges of this where those two surfaces made up. I'm going to go ahead and pop this uh, rod cap off and show you how the fillet radius, what kind of a relationship that thing has with the rods. If we look at this rod journal right here, I'm going to zoom in and get a better look at it. There's a little bit of a gap. You see how that clears the radius? Well, there's a little bevel cut at 45 degree radius that goes all the way around the journal of the rod comes in contact with that back side right there of the of the counterweight doesn't actually touch it it kind of floats in there if there's enough of a gap for it to rattle around it's supposed to be free floating but one of the things that you can note is where the bearing rides on that journal and it's most notably illustrated by where the dark spots are so there you go if you wind up with a set of rods that have a bigger bearing, you just need to make sure that it fits and makes clearance for the fillet radius. It's not on the quiz, but I'm going to measure the uh, thickness of the cap. This is the seal boss for the rear main seal. A little groove in it is normal. This one's actually in really good shape for 150,000 miles. But I've got a little trick to uh, compensate for this kind of thing that I'll show in another video with a new seal. You want to inspect all your crank bolt holes to make sure that there's no uh, nothing obstructing these things from doing their job. Whenever you're assembling this, you should put it back together with thread locker and follow the proper torque sequence. And so that usually leaves a little bit of junk behind, but having a fastener problem here at high RPMs can cause catastrophic failures in a number of different ways. Now all these oil holes go all the way through the crankshaft. They are in a straight line all the way through the, jur the uh, journal faces. And they're chamfered, which is what that uh, little angled cut is. 
right there below where the hole begins. They're chamfered in order to reduce the wear on the bearings and to provide a more steady oil flow. Now, some people make modifications to these and spread them out a little bit if they want a little bit more increased oil flow or they've made modifications to their oil pump. But uh, before you put this back in the motor, you want to grab a tube brush set and uh, run this through all the holes and clean them out real good with some carb cleaner. Um, it's a manual process indeed, but if you're doing this at home by yourself, that's how you do it. Uh, I'm going to be sending all of my parts off to a machine shop, so I likely won't spend much time doing that. But I'll definitely make sure that nothing comes out of those holes, nothing bad. So I was hoping I'd find some things wrong to be able to point out, but actually uh, that would have been bad if I did because this is the crankshaft I'm using. Fortunately, there's nothing wrong with it. Everything is in perfect specification with 150,000 miles on it. And uh, I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get the opportunity to show you a messed up crankshaft when uh, I disassemble the 7 bolt GSX engine. But uh, this is the one that's going back in it. Hope you guys have enjoyed. I'll come back with another video about oil clearances. And if uh, I missed anything or you got anything to add, feel free to leave it in the comments.